Well, I think we could get started now. Holly, um, welcome everyone to uh, the presentation today, Putting Beavers to Work. Uh, my name is John Degonye. I'm the president of the Society for Ecosystem Restoration in, the, in Northern BC, also known as CERN BC. And I'm also a forester that works for the provincial government of BC. Thanks uh, to everyone for coming today. Uh, I, I'd also like to acknowledge I'm on the uh, calling in from the traditional territory of Saikas First Nation and happy uh, to be able to do that. Um, CERN BC is, uh, is hosting this presentation today and, uh, and question and answer period to sort of uh, initiate a discussion around uh, this topic and I hope this as a beginning will lead to um, helping us deliver uh, more discussion and eventually uh, restor potential restoration projects in the future. And I'm really happy today to uh, introduce Holly Kinnis from the Backy Institute. Uh, Holly is a conservation analyst with the Institute. And uh, I was gonna try to summarize uh, what the Institute does in a very short form way, but you really need to check uh, their website. They do a lot of different things and they cover a lot of ground. Uh, one thing that I could say though, is uh, in relation to beavers, uh, there's something that um, jumped out at me on their website, and that is that they are facilitating the coexistence with beavers. So their benefits as a watershed resiliency and restoration tool are realized, and they would like to leave it to beavers. And I, I, I really like that concept of coexistence. And I think that is uh, something that CERNBC also uh, strives for as well. But um, I don't want to take up too much time. There's a lot of ground to cover in the presentation today. So I'll pass it off to Holly for uh, that. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you, John. Um, I'm so excited to be here today. So thanks to John and CERNBC for hosting this webinar. I'm excited to share some of the knowledge that I have on beavers and start some discussions about beavers. So we'll have time at the end of the presentation for questions. And if there's interest on certain topics, um, we can schedule a more detailed presentation at a later time if we want to dive deeper into those topics. So I'm just gonna get my presentation going here, get my Zoom off to the side so I can see my slides. Can everybody hear me okay? If you can't hear me, um, drop a message in the chat and then um, John will be able to help you out. But I think, I think we're sounding good. Are we good, John? I'm going to see. Yes, you're good. I just had to unmute. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Thanks. So I'm just going to do a quick little tech webinar overview um, after, you know, several months, a year and a half-ish of Zoom meetings. I'm sure this is old hat to many of us, um, but we will be recording today's presentation and we'll be later posting that on our YouTube channel uh, for people who aren't able to make the presentation today. So you are all muted by default. Um, we will be using the Q&A um, for questions. So if you wanna drop your questions in the Q&A, that would be great. Um, and I believe there's a feature now that you can upvote some of the questions. So if you have a similar question, you can vote for that one and it'll bump it up to the top. We'll also be using the chat box for any comments or if you're having technical issues, um, you can flag them there. And then when you do use the chat box, um, make sure you have it set to all panelists and attendees or everyone, um, whichever of those two options is available. Okay, I'm just gonna downsize my camera. There we go. Um, so I work for the Misaki Institute. So we're a nonprofit charitable applied research institute and we're affiliated with Mount Royal University located in Calgary, Alberta. So we do research that is accessible to communities and decision makers so that they can make choices that promote healthy landscapes. The Mistaki Institute's office is located in the traditional territories of the peoples of Treaty 7. However, our conservation work takes place on many different traditional indigenous territories. We acknowledge all the many First Nations, Métis and Inuit 
whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. So our project is called Putting Beavers to Work for Watershed Resiliency and Restoration. It's a partnership project that we have between the Misaki Institute and Cows and Fish, who are the Alberta Riparian Habitat Management Society. Our project began in 2012, where we quickly realized the potential for beavers to address our watershed woes. And we were approached by many landowners wanting to coexist with beavers and realize the benefits that they can have on their landscape. Our project strives to decrease the conflict with beavers, foster social tolerance, and heighten understanding of the benefits that beavers provide us and the ecosystem as a whole. Our restoration strategy is simple. Coexist with beavers, leave them on the landscape, and let them do the work. We've had a long and intertwined history with beavers in North America and globally. The beaver was made an official emblem of Canada in 1975, and there are many place names that include beaver. As you can see here, even in Alberta alone, there's 50 place names, um, and the sign is Beaver County, which is a rural municipality here in Alberta. In the 1600s, European explorers discovered that beavers were bountiful in North America, which greatly suited their needs for the production of top hats. They were all the rave in Europe at this time, and the Eurasian beaver, castor fiber, had been hunted to near extinction and was extirpated in many countries and still is today. Between the 16 and 1800s, beavers in North America were also hunted to near extinction due to the fur trade with estimates of a population reduction of 90 to 97% across North America. Today, the fur trade era is over, but beaver pelts are still being used to create um, some products such as the felt cowboy hat that you can see in the photo here, but the price per pelt is greatly reduced, so it's no longer considered an economical trade to trap and sell beaver pelts. Today, beavers are mostly trapped um, just for the purposes of removing a nuisance beaver. I'm going to go a little bit into the life history now of beavers, which explains why they do what they do and how they can cause us some headaches. So the North American beaver, Castor canadensis, is the largest rodent in North America, weighing up to 70 pounds. And trust me, I have seen a beaver this large. Um, here in Calgary, there is one that, that is quite this large. Beavers are semi-aquatic mammals living both in the water and on the land. They have webbed feet and they have a large paddle-like tail, which they use as a rudder for swimming, packing mud onto their dam to waterproof it, and they use it as warnings. If you've ever gotten too close to a beaver in a pond, um, you'll, you'll soon know what the warning is. They will slap their tail very hard against the water um, and you can hear it from a fair distance away. Their uniquely developed teeth allow them to cut trees and other vegetation with ease. Their incisors have a high iron content on the front, while the backside of the incisor is soft, creating a self-sharpening edge, perfect for tree cutting. You can also see their webbed feet in this photo here. And again, this is, I believe, another urban beaver here in Calgary. They, of course, are most well known for their tree cutting abilities which they use to build dams and lodges. So lodges act as a shelter and the dams act to store water to provide them with protection from predators, ease of transport of cut trees as they can drag those trees down the watery canals that they build and safety for the lodge as well. But beavers don't just eat tree bark. Their diet is seasonally dependent. So as you can see here, um, some of the other components that make up their diet include cattails, water lilies, forbs, duckweed, and occasionally a crop field, depending on if they're on agricultural land or not. Their colony size tends to range between two to six individuals, um, and the young will actually stay with their parents for about two years. So within that two year time, they undertake an apprenticeship with their parents where they learn how to be expert dam builders. And when it is time to disperse, they'll travel over 15 kilometers over land to find a new territory of their own as beavers are quite territorial. And it is interesting to note too that there have been some cases where um, 
the parent beavers are so um, are so entwined with raising their young that they will actually help the young beavers disperse, find a home, set up a lodge before they return to their own home. So due to their biology, beavers have earned themselves the title of keystone species and ecosystem engineer. They can help us restore our watersheds and enhance their resiliency at a lower cost than what gray infrastructure can provide while also providing us with additional ecosystem services. They can help us address both flood and drought, and I'll explain how. Beavers modify valleys. Over time, beaver activity changes a steep gradient stream into a flatter stair-stepped one that widens the valley. Deep rich soils result from centuries of sediment capture behind the dams, creating fertile valley bottoms. Once beavers abandon their dams, the effect of beaver on the stream valleys and vegetation lingers long past abandonment. Old dams may become enduring landscape features. The arrows on the image here indicate beaver dams in a beaver modified valley, and you can see the extent of the floodplain. During the historic Alberta floods of 2013, Dr. Sherry Westbrook from the University of Saskatchewan had data loggers in streams in the Kananaskis region of Alberta's east slopes. She found that beaver dams retained floodwaters, delayed flood peaks, and about two thirds of the dams were not washed away, which is pretty impressive um, when you compare it to the impacts that were had on a lot of the gray infrastructure that we had in our streams. Beaver dams really act as speed bumps on streams. They decrease the stream velocity or speed by about 81% and they decrease stream power by 92%, which is really important when you're thinking about things like bank erosion. Beaver dams also capture and store sediment. So they can ca capture up to 6,500 cubic meters per pond. So that's behind one dam in one pond. Granted, it would be a very large pond at this scale, um, but they can capture a lot of sediment. So just to give perspective, that's about 382 tandem dump truck loads of sediment. And included in that sediment are things, um, contaminants such as herbicides, um, nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus, pathogens such as E. coli, um, they all bond to the sediment particles. So really you're getting um, much better water quality downstream of these dams. Carbon is also sequestered in beaver ponds and there's some current research going on right now in Kananaskis to actually measure that carbon. This means, of course, that downstream of beaver dams, we see um, all these fewer suspended solids, less phosphorus, less nitrogen, less carbon floating in the stream, and reduced fecal coliforms. So on that pleasant note, I just want to address beaver fever. Um, unfortunately for beavers, it was just a catchy name that rhymed with fever. So beavers have um, the same likelihood of passing on giardia or beaver fever um, as any other wildlife that, that spends its life in a stream. So unfortunate for beavers, that is a myth that they cause beaver fever. So beaver workings contribute substantially to the complexity, connectivity, and vegetation diversity of landscapes, which of course translate into many more opportunities for wildlife on, near, or beneath the surface of beaver ponds. Their activities basically create more habitat for more wildlife. In many places in the U.S., beavers are being brought back specifically to create habitat for endangered species such as trumpeter swans and for salmon species. Beaver ponds retain 50%, uh, sorry, they retain water 50% longer than stream sections without any beaver activity on them. This is because the amount of groundwater they store is quite vast. So the diagram here depicts the process that allows beaver ponds to recharge our groundwater supplies. The pie chart shows the portion of water in a beaver pond is a small amount compared to the portion that gets stored as groundwater. Not only do beaver ponds store water, but they deliver water too. 
by slowing water down and allowing for shallow groundwater capture, downstream flows can be enhanced by two to 10 times. Beaver activity has been shown to change intermittent streams to ones that flow year round, which is critically important for water scarce places such as Southern Alberta and other places across Canada. Most importantly, through groundwater release, cold water is delivered in low flow periods when fish and downstream users need it most. Beavers create much needed slow water environments such as ponds and they increase steam, stream habitat complexity and riparian vegetation. So they increase water quality and quantity, they decrease stream temperatures, they create beneficial overwintering habitat and thermal refuge, which is usually in the ponds because they're quite deep. And they, um, they create spawning habitat that is free from sediment. And these would be downstream, of course, of the ponds and the dams. There is agreement in scientific research that beavers have a net benefit on native fish populations, including trout, salmon, and other stream fishes. They increase riparian vegetation, which increases the food supply of insects. They increase fish production, resulting in more and larger fish. Beavers create, oh, yes, no, we went back a slide. There we go. Beavers, are native, beavers and native fish have evolved together. Beaver dams can act as a temporary or seasonal barrier but no study has ever demonstrated a detrimental population level effect on beaver dam, of beaver dams on native fish species. Beavers and beaver dam analogs, which I'll explain in a little bit, are being used to restore stream habitat in the United States for conservation of imperiled fish species, including salmonids. Despite all the ecological benefits that beavers can provide, we recognize their industrious work can create many challenges for coexistence. So traditionally, beaver management looked like this, removing the dams either by hand, with equipment, or with explosives. Trapping or shooting is also a traditional approach to removing nuisance beavers. These approaches are often a temporary solution, as if you have a population of beavers nearby, they will likely move right back into the area. I call this the beaver black hole. But there are alternatives that allow beavers to stay in place while also mitigating the impacts that they have on our infrastructure or lands. The top right photo is a culvert protector. It is used to exclude the beaver and prevent it from plugging the culvert and flooding the area. The left photo shows a beaver proof culvert which has a grate on the top and the bottom of the T-junction, which prevents the beaver from swimming into the culvert with sticks and debris. It also funnels the sound of the running water upwards so that the beaver has less of a desire to plug the culvert. Maintenance on culvert protectors like these should be conducted um, typically twice a year, like in the spring and the fall, and that's to ensure that there's no um, debris buildup, especially on the, the caged one there, that there's no debris buildup on the sides. So the way that that shape is put together, the trapezoid, um, as the water pushes through, if the beavers do try to stick, um, stick sticks, stick, put some sticks and muds on the outside of the wire, um, the water should just push it off to the sides. So occasionally, about every twice a year, you need to go and check to make sure that's still occurring and then just remove any of the sticks that have kind of gathered onto the sides of that, that culvert protector. So the time required to maintain and check these culvert protectors is much more minimal compared to the time it takes to clear debris from a plugged culvert, which I'm sure many of you can attest to uh, having to do probably on a weekly basis um, and having a crew of two, two people or more trying to clear that culvert. So, this is much less time consuming. Another coexistence tool we can use is called a pond leveler. Let me, there we go, there's our diagram. So it essentially acts like a bathtub, bathtub overflow. The height of the pipe is set in the dam and that will be the maximum water level of the upstream pond. 
The cage around the inlet prevents the beaver from plugging the pipe and reduces the sensation of rushing water. Since the inlet is located far from the outlet, the beavers can't figure out how the water is actually leaking out of the pipe and the dam on, on the downside. The outlet only flows when the water level is too high. Usually it's just a small trickle. In the photo that you can see here, it was just installed, so there's a lot of flow happening right now, um, but normally it would just be a trickle. The beaver usually cannot plug this outlet end of the pipe as it's working against the flow of water. But if a beaver is particularly crafty, you can sometimes, um, it just requires putting a little bit of like a gate at the end of the outlet, and then that usually solves the problem because any sticks that get in there will just be washed away um, next time there's a high water level. And although fish should have no problems passing through a dam or even through um, a pond leveler, we've seen them do that successfully as well. Um, if there are concerns or species of, at risk in the stream, this is another option um, that can be explored as well. So these are two, I have, there's two new techniques that are being researched right now. Um, so the one you're looking at here is the Snohomish Pond Leveler from the Beaver Institute. Um, and they're on the East Coast in the US. Um, so they're, they're trying out this. It basically combines a pond leveler um, with kind of like a fish, fish ladder at the base of it. Um, there's also another group called Humane Solutions. They're based in Vancouver and they have a similar system that they've called the fish lift. So I can include a link to that in the comments as it's pretty neat. They have some GoPro footage of fish actually going through the fish lift. Um, so I'll, I'll put that in the comments after the presentation. So based on various different studies, coexistence tools such as pond levelers and culvert protectors result in a cost savings between 44 and 90% compared to traditional management approaches. So we also have this fact sheet on our website. Um, it's great for building the business case as to why these tools are so great to use. And typically a pond leveler, which would be the more expensive of the two tools, um, costs about $1,000 in materials to put together. So you recoup your costs pretty fast when you think about the maintenance required to clear dams or clear plugged culverts. Um, so I'm happy to provide some more information on that. And there's a lot more on our website as well. And of course, tree wrapping or exclusion fencing is another coexistence tool that we can use. So when it's installed correctly, it protects our prized trees or tree stands from being damaged and removed by beavers. So in Alberta, we typically wire our trees from the ground to about four feet up. And this is to account for snowfall. Um, and we use 14 to 16 gauge wire mesh. So this is a pretty fine wire mesh here. Um, this is used in the city of Calgary, this photo. Um, and we were finding that the beavers were getting quite crafty at trying to cut through the mesh, I guess you could say. Um, and so we, we went to like the finer scale mesh. Uh, but if you try to wire a tree with chicken wire, the beaver is just going to cut right through it. So as part of our beaver project, we host coexistence workshops where participants learn how to properly install culvert protectors or pond levelers or a combination of the two. They are very cost effective, simple to install, but they do need to be tailored to each site and maintained to be sure that they're effective. So typically our workshops, we host um, two to three of them a year. And in a non-COVID world, we would have 15 to 20 participants. Um, these numbers have been a little bit smaller, of course, with COVID, um, just to adhere to the safety requirements. Um, but we are still doing these and there's a huge demand for these to be installed in Alberta. We also have demonstration sites. Um, so basically where we have installed pond levelers or culvert protectors, um, we'll take others who are interested in that sort of technique and tour them to the sites. We also track the health of these demonstration sites with riparian health assessments. So Cows and Fish leads a lot of that work as well. So our beaver project is now exploring the use of beaver mediated restoration. So this allows beavers or beaver mimicry to do the stream restoration for us. This is a beaver dam analog, a BDA. 
It's a habitat management tool that mimics a naturally occurring beaver dam. They're also known as beaver mimicry, beaver mimicry restoration, artificial beaver dams, and simulated beaver dams. A BDA is a simple, small uh, dam that's often installed in series along a stream segment. The structure is built in stream using upright posts, which are either natural or sometimes a manufactured fence post, as long as it's not pressure treated. Um, and then a natural weave material is used in between the posts. So this is typically willow, spruce, or whatever, whatever the other on-site vegetation may be. And at the base, it's then packed with gravel or mud. So essentially, we are trying to be the beaver in area. This is important in areas that maybe beavers have been historically trapped out. There's not a nearby beaver population to repopulate it. And in Alberta and in BC, um, beaver relocation is not a readily accessible tool. So this is kind of a nice in-between step that you can get some of the stream restoration you're looking for. And if there are hopefully beavers nearby, this will create enough habitat for them that they might be able to come to this area, um, overtake your BDA, and then start maintaining it for themselves and expand on the, expand on the restoration. Sometimes posts can also be installed to support existing beaver dams. So if you do, did have a dam that blew out or the beavers were trapped out and weren't able to maintain it, that's usually a good starting point for installation of a BDA. So BDAs are being installed in parts of the Pacific North, Northwest um, for the purposes of stream restoration, uh, mostly targeted at um, restoring salmon and other fish habitat. Um, they've also been used for restoring sage grouse habitat as well. So once a BDA is installed, if beavers are nearby, they will adopt the dam and maintain it. Uh, we have not yet tried this technique ourselves, unfortunately, but there is a large appetite for the use of this restoration tool. We get a lot of calls about this and how to do it um, and how to do it well. Uh, we will be working with the Blood Tribe here in Southern Alberta in the coming months to plan for a BDA installation of our own. So you'll have to stay tuned for that. And to help select our BDA site, we will be running a GIS model called BRAT, the Beaver Restoration Assessment Tool. So BRAT is a planning tool that's intended to help researchers, restoration practitioners, and resource managers to assess the potential for beaver as a stream conservation and restoration agent over large regions and watersheds. So BRAT estimates the upper limit of dam density for individual stream reaches throughout a drainage network. It focuses on predicting where beavers could build dams and to what extent, which you can see here um, in the graph with the different colors indicating that blue, you could have 16 to 40 dams within a blue segment um, all the way down to red, which would mean beavers likely would not build a dam there. So a lot of the inputs with this um, modeling are hydrological inputs, um, vegetation like land cover inputs. So would there be ample forage for a beaver to come and live into this area um, as well as slope? So this model was developed at Utah State University and has been run in various watersheds in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, it runs on freely available data in the U.S. However, when it comes to Canada, it's a bit more complicated due to limitations in data avail uh, availability. And some of our freely available data sets do not align well with the ones available in the U.S. So we're currently pursuing the use of BRAT. Um, later this month, we're going to be um, developing, developing our own Alberta BRAT tool um, and looking at those data sets and how we can convert them to to usable inputs for this model. Um, and we'll be starting this work uh, in the Old Man Watershed in Southern Alberta. So where do you stand? Will you fear the beaver or will you work with them to keep our watersheds healthy? I would like to thank our funder, the Alberta government's Watershed Resiliency and Restoration Program. And I would like to thank our host as well, John with CERN BC. I will leave my contact information up here for a few seconds for you guys if you would like to reach out. Um, and please note the link at the bottom there are rockies.ch slash beavers. So that'll take you right to our beaver website where we have lots of additional information and YouTube videos and that sort of thing.